Good afternoon and welcome to Sundays with DINSN. I am your host slash digital director, Gilberta Washington. And we have a special guest for you today. But before I get into who's the special guest, I would like to let you know what DINSN represents and what is the mission. DINSN is a bipartisan coalition of national security and foreign policy practitioners committed to diversifying the national security private and public sector. Our mission is to help elevate diverse voices in national security and foreign policy realm. With that being said, we have an exciting guest for you today who has paved the way for diverse voices like ourselves. He is a retired United States four-star general officer who served as the inaugural commander of the United States Africa Command, AFRICOM. He was a deputy commander at the US headquarters in Germany. He previously served as the deputy commanding general chief of staff in Europe. While in the capacity, he was selected by secretary of the state to serve as the United States secretary coordinator in Israel Palestinian Authority. During this long career in public service, he taught international affairs and relations at West Point. He also did many other progressively responsible assignments. He later retired and served as the president and CEO of CENTU. Without further ado, it's my esteemed honor and pleasure to start this exciting dialogue with Mr. William E. Kip Ward. Well, hello everyone and good afternoon uh, to Roberto as well as the entire diversity and national security network. I'm honored to be able to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon uh, to talk a bit about my career as a United States Army officer, uh, as well as the importance that I ascribe to the international affairs and national security areas of endeavor uh, being absolutely populated with a diverse population with respect to what it means. I served as a, a officer in the military for over 40 years. I'm a graduate of Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. I graduated in 1971 with a degree in political science, thinking that I would spend four years. I had a four-year obligation uh, of active duty, uh, given that I had an ROTC scholarship my last two years at Morgan. But my intent was to then leave the Army, uh, return to the civilian sector, and go to law school, become a lawyer. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, my four-year commitment turned into over four decades of service to our nation as I proudly wore the cloth of our nation in uniform. I had a very diverse career uh, serving all around the world uh, to include the continent of the United States and also Alaska and Hawaii, from Europe uh, to the Middle East, to Asia, uh, Indo-Pacific area, and Africa. And every assignment was an assignment that I felt was important as it brought additional support to our national security objectives and endeavors. And importantly, being able to spend 40 years as a military officer, uh, as well as being a husband and a dad uh, for all that time, something that my family also supported me in. And for that, I'm deeply, deeply responsible. It's often said, you know, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, whatever the case may be, uh, that person enlists as an individual, but their entire family serves. And that was no less the case for me and my family as they supported me uh, and traveled with me, uh, except for my combat tours around the world. And I believe that too was an enhancing experience for them as they are now all grown and on their own. My wife and I still talk about how wonderful and how rich those experiences were for, for us and for our children. So I'll stop there and uh, I'll go to a bit more of my career as we go through the discussion. But for now, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave it at there, Roberto. And over All to right. you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you today. I want to say that. Um, I heard you say something about ROTC. I want you to like take us back to uh, when you were a student in Morgan State University. And can you elaborate more on why students at Morgan State should consider enrolling in ROTC programs today? Well, thanks. Uh, and I'll certainly broaden this. Uh, Morgan State was my particular experience 
But what I have to say about my experience at Morgan uh, as in ROTC, but also any college or university that offers the program, why it would be in my mind's eye important for any student to consider uh, ROTC. First, you're gonna get paid. You're gonna get paid so that there's absolutely no reason where a, a person who was enrolled in college or university, where there's an ROTC program for them to have a problem with paying for their education. ROTC will pay in its entirety, room and board, the scholarships, other programs that affiliations with the, the Guard and Reserve so that there are funds available. For, now, it's not just gonna be given to you, uh, but you have to earn it and the student in good standing the benefit of it is something that comes back over and over again. Firstly, of course, you leave college with no large college debt. You're able to complete college. Uh, the things that many of us have to do with respect to working uh, while we're in school, uh, those additional responsibilities can be ameliorated to varying degrees. For me, when I entered Morgan uh, in 1967, the Vietnam War was in full force. And uh, it was going to school or getting drafted. And my thought was, well, if I'm gonna go to Vietnam, I'll go as an officer. And so as I enrolled in, the, in Morgan, in those years, uh, it was mandatory at certain universities and not just the predominantly black colleges and universities, the HBCUs, other universities that had land grant affiliations, uh, Texas A&M, North Carolina State, many schools, Michigan State, ROTC was mandatory two years for all male students. Didn't have to stay in the program. You could get out after the two years, but then you were, you were eligible to be drafted. And my point was, I'm gonna stay in ROTC, finish my college degree, get a diploma, get a commission. And if I'm gonna go into the military, I'll go in as an officer. And that's what I did. That experience at Morgan State University and the ROTC piece of it in particular prepared me for every challenge that I was to face throughout my career because the foundational tenets were established during those times. The ability to lead, to understand, to analyze the discipline that it brought, the, uh, the responsibility that it put on my shoulders to be a part of a team, a team to make a difference, all those things became a part of it. And then to have a sense of purpose of that what we did mattered. And so for me, live, pursuing the ROTC beyond my initial two years, and as I said, I received a scholarship as well that paid for the final two years of my college education with respect to my tuition was an absolute godsend that I'm so appreciative of. And because of that background and experience, my success that I enjoyed in my early years of, of serving on active duty propelled me to a career of service as well as a career of continued achievement uh, with, that I was able to build upon as I progressively stayed in the military. And as I indicated, only planned to stay initially four years. So why did I stay longer than that? Well, it was because of the success of those four years, that those initial four years, and that success was certainly based on the experience that I had at Morgan from my professors, my fellow students, the professors of military science, my regular college professors, many of whom had also had military experience given those at that, that time. And again, what you learned then kept me firmly informed, kept me firmly grounded to do things that I would to do later on in my military service. The ROTC program was a foundation of that. And of course, along with the values uh, that I had picked up and learned and that were inculcated into me from my family, my mom, my dad, other members of my family who had served, et cetera, et cetera. And I think those same experiences are available to students today, be they at Morgan or any other college or university uh, with an ROTC program. Taking advantage of that will be nothing but goodness for them as they move down the road. Thank you for explaining that, sir. Um, now, um, I would like to ask you a few questions about uh, your assign you being assigned to AFRICOM and being a commander there. 
and um, you becoming the first black combatant commander. Would you, ex would you explain your role of AFRICOM in the mission as well? Sure. <clears throat> as our nation uh, was organized, this Department of Defense is organized into geographic commands with responsibility for Defense Department operations around the world. Uh, many of these you are aware of, the one that is in the news most of the time, especially for the time frame that most of you on this, uh, in this uh, platform would know, would be United States Central Command, who pr prosecuted the, the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, a combatant command, a global combatant command. But, that, but there were five of those geographic commands. There was US Pacific Command, US European Command, US Southern Command, uh, US Central Command. Uh, Africa and its environs, there were three of those combatant commands had responsibility for doing Department of Defense activities on the continent of Africa, as well as its Indian Ocean Island nations. So you had on the African landscape, three different commands conducting Department of Defense activities on various parts of the area of responsibility, European Command, Central Command, and Pacific Command. So in 2006, 2007 timeframe, the President, Secretary of Defense, given the importance of Africa and given the need to have a more cohesive approach to what we were doing, the decision was made to stand up a brand new combatant command dedicated to the African continent and its island nations. And that was the United States Africa Command. And I was confirmed by the United States Senate after being appointed by the president, President George W. Bush, to be AFRICOM's inaugural commander. For me, that was an, an, an immensely important uh, responsibility. I was honored to have done it. Uh, I went into that job because at the time that I was selected to be the first combatant commander of African American heritage, I have, was serving as the deputy commander of the United States European Command, which at that time was also a four-star billet. It's, it no longer is, but at that time it was. And in Europe, European Command, the, the commander was also the commander of NATO. And that commander spent a lot of time dealing with the NATO alliance. And so when it came to the day-to-day -day operations of the combatant command, and, we, and you must remember now, in, in a combatant command, it's comprised of all services. Now, I'm an army officer, but, but the, the combatant commands are joint commands. So there is Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard, and civilians in those commands. I was the deputy commander of US European Command, responsible for, for all the, air, the activities being done on the, on the continent of Europe and also the part of Africa that was in that UCOM had responsibility for. When we created AFRICOM, when AFRICOM was stood up in 2007, I became its first commander. And so for the first time, there was a black American that was in charge of one of these combatant commands that I've described to you uh, a minute ago. And the activities and actions that we carried out were all the things that were needed to be done when it came to implementing and conducting Department of Defense activities on the continent of Africa and its, with its and the island nations, especially the Indian Ocean island nations. <clears throat> Comoros in the Indian Ocean, Cape Verde in the Atlantic Ocean. The military, the military activities were a part of that dynamic. I would meet with the the chiefs of defense staff, the heads of militaries, but also the, the heads of state of the various countries in Africa as we worked side by side with them to help them be more capable of providing for their own security. AFRICOM was not established as no command is established to station large numbers of troops in, other, in, the, in their areas, but established to provide military military support, military to military training to partner nations 
who have similar ideals, objectives to ours, so we operate in our national interests to help them increase their capability of providing for their own security, and as such, making the continent more stable and more secure. So we conducted exercises, we conducted training sessions, professional development scenarios, where we train militaries, non-commissioned officers, officers, helping them to increase their capabilities to make their own countries more safe and more secure. To include the, mar the maritime side of it, you know, off the coast of Africa, both the East Coast and West Coast, you had piracy, you had illegal fishing, and their militaries, their navies, their coast guards had limited capabilities in controlling what was going on. Nations coming in from outside of the region, overfishing, robbing them of their national treasure and resources, taking more fish from the waters that was uh, that was supposed to be occurring, not paying taxes on that, so to speak, but also robbing the people of the nu nutritional value that they were themselves gathering from being able to fish off their coast of their waters. They didn't have the ability to, to patrol, to ensure that their territorial waters weren't being violated by other, other nations. So AFRICOM provided support in all those areas when it came to helping them increase their professional abilities to, to provide for their own security. But also when it came to providing an example of how professional militaries conduct themselves in societies, because militaries have a role to play. Uh, part of the, 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 of the dynamic included trying to instill a sense of conduct so that militaries and democracies don't have coups don't take over, take charge. We take our lawful orders from our civilian authorities that are elected by the, in democracies. And so you have in this case, uh, these relationships that we were, were establishing so that we were, examples were being provided. But in addition to that, a two-way street because we also learn from them. Obviously being a part of a training situation, we were exchanging ideas, and the, the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen, the Marines, the Coast Guardsmen that were part of AFRICOM on these exercises, doing things, or working with these partner nations and building relationships, understanding their culture, their heritage, their traditions, and as such giving us a better understanding of what we were doing and how it related to them so that when we did things, it meshed and supported itself in a more cohesive fashion. It was mutually rewarding. And in the end, we all would benefit from it. We had a more stable area uh, that was now less susceptible to being, to being overrun or being influenced by, by nefarious or bad actors. Remember during this time, 2007, 2008, 2009, the fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq was going on, the, the, the global war on terrorism, and how we tried to keep that from spreading required these other nations in, in Africa and other places to be better capable of preventing those incursions into their own security. So our activities were all activities that were done in conjunction with other work being done in our government, the Department of State, the United States Agency for International Development, our other cabinet departments from commerce to homeland security, the treasury, agriculture, all doing work as a part of trying to provide a more stable global environment. And we in AFRICOM would be related to that, interrelated, coordinating uh, with them so that our work was synchronized so that the whole effort that was being done by the United States was moving in a direction that would produce a result that would lead to a more stable environment for our African friends and partners. That was so critically important then, it's still important today. And AFRICOM is the Department of Defense activity responsible for doing that on the continent of Africa and the allied nations, just as the other combatant commands that I mentioned, UCOM, PACOM, CENTCOM, SOUTHCOM, NORTHCOM, Northern Command, all do it for parts of the, the uh, global, global commons. You also have experience in diplomacy. President George W. Bush and Secretary of the State Rice nominated you 
to be the special envoy to Israel and Palestine. Could you describe your role as a special envoy to Israel and Palestine? Yeah, I will, uh, uh, Gilberto. That, that, that was a pretty unique scenario, how that all evolved. Uh, at the time, I was the uh, deputy commander uh, of United States Army Europe, stationed in Heidelberg, Germany. I had just left being the NATO commander, North Atlantic Treaty Organization commander of a multinational force. I had 27 different nations work with me uh, in Bosnia. I was the commander of the stabilization force in Bosnia and had left that in early 2000, uh, late 2003, going to Heidelberg to be the deputy <laughs> commanding general of United States Army Europe there in Heidelberg. And had been there for, I don't know what the time frame is, several months. And I had been visiting some of my soldiers in parts of Germany. And as I was heading back to my office, I got a call uh, from uh, my office uh, admin assistant saying, sir, the uh, secretary would like to speak to you. And I'm not sure what secretary we're talking about here. What secretary we're talking about here? The secretary, so I'll, I'm on my way back. Uh, now I'll be back in the office in uh, half an hour or so. So I'll speak to the secretary then, thinking it was maybe a, one of the secretaries in one of the agencies there in US Army Europe. So, and, and, and Dolph said, no, sir, no, sir, it's, it's the Secretary of State. And I knew that the Secretary of State was Condoleezza Rice. So, well, why in the world is Condoleezza Rice calling me? I take the phone call and at the other end of the line is uh, her office. And the, as soon as I was on the line, the person said, uh, uh, General, stand by, uh, Secretary was, is right here. And the phone comes on and Secretary Rice says, she calls me by name. She calls me by my first name. She says, like, Can we'd like you to go to Israel. And that was just out of the blue. Where did this come from? And uh, the decision was, the comment was made that we've decided that you are the person that we'd like to go to Israel for a special assignment to work with the Israelis and the Palestinians uh, as our security coordinator. And I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, what, what do I need to know about this? I said, well, uh, we'd like you to come back to Washington as soon as you can, like tomorrow. And again, I'm in Heidelberg, Germany, to get a briefing from the national security staff and the uh, community to get updated on what's going on, and then go to Israel uh, for a month or two uh, to do some special things with the Israelis and the Palestinians. So I get back to my office, talk to my team there, make flight arrangements to fly from Germany back to DC to meet with the national security st uh, staff and get some updates on what's going on. But as it turned out, there were some critical times uh, there in the Middle East, in Israel with the Palestinians. And there was a need to increase the confidence between the two sides. If the Palestinians were to be able to take over some of the security responsibilities, the Israelis needed to know that they were capable of doing it. And at the same token, the Palestinians needed to know that if, the, if they were to do these things, that the Israelis would give them the latitude to do it because of some mutual respect that the two would have each other. And to make this happen, a part of that, of that dynamic included a special coordinator, a security coordinator to work with the Israelis and the Palestinians on those sorts of things and issues. In that role, I got the term is seconded. I was seconded from my military responsibility. I'm still an active duty general officer to be sure. But I worked directly for the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. I come back to the state of, to, to DC, back to the States, get my briefing from then the National Security Advisor was Stephen Hadley. Condoleezza Rice had been a security advisor, but she was now the Secretary of State, obviously. So I met with the Secretary of State. Uh, the Defense Secretary was Donald Rumsfeld because he had to concur with my doing this mission. So it was the Secretary of State Rice, and he had concurred with this, had taken that decision, along with the ambassador in Israel, who I had uh, met years before when I had worked on an assignment in Egypt. Uh, as the working with our security assistance program in Egypt. Now, I met the ambassador uh, there, who was later now the ambassador in Israel, the, U the U.S. ambassador. So he also knew me. 
And the, the determination was that we think Kip Ward is the person that can come here and do what our nation needs to be done at this point in time. I'm back in DC, I'm getting the briefings from the national security staff, meeting with the Secretary of State, State Department, obviously the Defense Department as well, going around meeting with other, uh, the intelligence agencies, getting good understanding and clarity. And prior to leaving to come back to Germany to make my way to Israel, I also had a meeting with the President of the United States, uh, talk, talking about the importance of the, of, the, of the assignment. That experience, you know, as a special envoy, uh, that diplomacy piece, because while that gave me the opportunity to work with the President, Prime Minister of Israel, who was at the time uh, Ariel Sharon, uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. And so I was working with heads of state, you know, obviously understanding what our U.S. foreign policy objectives were, but then being the principal interlocutor, carrying those messages to those heads of state. The good news is that that wasn't my first time in doing that, because as the commander of the NATO force in Bosnia, and given the inter international flavor of Bosnia in those days, I also had gone back to the United Nations, uh, uh, working with the uh, United Nations High Representative there in, in Sarajevo. Uh, again, I had 27 different nations in my command. So as those nations, if, as their elected officials would come to visit them, I would meet with them as well, talking about the performance of their soldiers in my command. So I had this sort of experience working with the diplomats from other countries as well. And so when I get to Israel as the US security coordinator, it was for me just another step in being able to work with heads of state at, at the diplomatic realm. As a general officer in many, many instances, yes, we, we command, and I was privileged to command army formations. I was a division commander. Uh, in Hawaii, commanding almost 30,000 soldiers and all my combined formations. But also in that, when you go and you train in other places, you visit various parts of the, your, the area that you operate in. I'm meeting with the heads of state from Japan, Thailand, Cambodia. So I'm, I'm, I'm garnering this sort of exposure and experience working with heads of state and diplomats from other countries. And so the, the position in Israel as a US security coordinator was just another step on that journey as I was working now directly with on a daily basis with the uh, heads of state and the senior officials, be they foreign ministers, defense ministers of the Israeli uh, government, as well as the Palestinian Authority. Wonderful experience for me because it truly brought home how the security aspect of what we do as soldiers, as sailors, and when I say soldiers, I, I use it in a generic form, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, women and men who are in the security business for our, for our country. It's not just about shooting a rifle, launching a missile, dropping a bomb. These other pieces are so critically important to that. And that's another reason why having a population of civil servants, government servants who are engaged in this diplomacy sphere is so important because we bring different perspectives to that based on our experiences, based on who we are. And those perspectives and, and experiences add richness to the discussion, add additional flavor to the conversation, alternatives that might, might not otherwise be considered. And when they're all brought together, they lead to better decisions for the type of policies we put in place, the type of actions that we take. And so for me, that experience as the US security coordinator was brought all that together because I did it. As I said, I was told that when I went over, this will probably be for a month or two to do some very specific things. Well, that month or two that it was, initially set up to be, turned out to be almost a year that I spent in Israel as our, as our US security coordinator working with the Israelis and the Palestinians. And, that, and to this day, 
I remember those days. Uh, many who I worked with, uh, I also continue to, to recall and remember. I worked side by side with many of our government uh, agencies and activities there, uh, the embassy there in Israel, uh, our, our uh, uh, counselor services activity in Jerusalem. I spent time in Gaza, uh, a time in the West Bank, uh, working with the Palestinians, time in you know, Tel Aviv, time in Jerusalem, going all over the, the Holy Land, if you will, uh, visiting and, and assessing so that the things that I brought back to our government with respect to our policies were formed based on the totality of my experience that I was gathering while I was there. And being able to report that directly back to the Secretary of State for her to then uh, infuse into our national decision-making process was really a big, uh, something that I still feel heady about, the fact that we were able to make that contribution. You don't know where you're going to find yourself in those sorts of things, but when you have jobs over time that prepare you for that, then you get th thrust into those positions, then you're ready to do it. And as just as I said with my experience at Morgan, you do things today that you have no idea that they're preparing you for, for tomorrow. But when you do them, you do them with excellence, you do them well, they, it all builds and it all contributes to things to come uh, down the road. So for me, that experience uh, as the U.S. Security Coordinator, just another culmination of this interrelationship between the military and diplomacy was so, so critically important. And there was a third element to it as well. And that was the whole notion of development, and economic advancement and social development so that the peoples could have a better life as well. All those things come together to make a difference. So it's not just one aspect of our decision making or our ability to make a difference. It's, it's the defense piece of it. It's the diplomacy piece of it. And it's also the, the development piece of it, the economic advancement, the social so again, the, the, the time spent that I spent in Israel uh, uh, working with the Palestinians uh, was a culmination to that point of all that I had done before, uh, working uh, in various places, uh, the, the embassy in Egypt, as I mentioned, when I worked in Egypt, the embassy there, the time that I'd spent working uh, as a division commander in Hawaii, visiting countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, area, the Pacific realm, uh, the time that I spent uh, in Bosnia as the NATO commander, working with the 27 different countries that were part of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, my command there, meeting their, their heads of state, you know, their officials who come in to see, visit their forces, and then taking all that to Israel, working with the heads of state there, uh, it, as well as the Palestinian Authority. Those were experiences that you build up. You're in a position, you're thrust into a position, you work things, you understand, and you see the diversity of that, the richness of that, and that was all brought together when I was able to take that to, to Israel and make work with the Palestinians. And Condoleezza Rice was a great, great person to work, work for. I reported directly to the Secretary of State as a special envoy, as a U.S. Security Coordinator. And again, at, for that period of time, while I was, I was an active duty officer, I was working directly for the Secretary of State. So my, the, the Defense Department, I certainly kept my Defense Department uh, in, in, informed, but I, would, I would reported to the Secretary of State and not the Secretary of Defense for, for that period of time. Thank you for explaining, uh, explaining that, General Ward. Um, I know there is uh, many people that you call your friends or you don't call your friends, but it's not a lot of people that you call your mentor. Uh, General Colin Powell's legacy is known for outstanding leadership in national security. General Powell was your mentor. Could you share your experience with General Powell and what kind of leadership principles you learned from him? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, obviously General Colin Powell uh, uh, was uh, a huge, huge figure in our, in our lifetime. Uh, the likes of which we only see every so often, very, very rarely. And I was indeed privileged to, to know him, uh, to be able to sit with him and glean from him things that certainly made a difference for me. I first knew of Colin Powell in 1975 
Uh, I was a, I think I was a, may have been a first lieutenant, maybe a brand new promoted captain. Uh, and he was a lieutenant, a lieutenant colonel. We were in Korea. Uh, he was one of the few uh, black battalion commanders in the second infantry division. And I was one of only two at the time, black infantry, infantry company commanders in the division. Now I wasn't in his outfit. In fact, we were in separate brigades, but I knew of him because of who he was. <clears throat> uh, we didn't meet then, uh, uh, but I knew who Colin Powell was uh, during those days uh, in 1975. Had a chance to meet him for the first time in 1980, either 82 or 80, maybe 83. When I was a student at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, and, and General Powell was a, a Brigadier General, a one-star general who had come to uh, Fort Leavenworth to be the Deputy Commandant of the Combined Arms Center there at Fort Leavenworth. And we met, and we met at that time. Not, not as a, we met, I was a part of a group, a group of us uh, who were there, uh, met with him and uh, had some discussions uh, with him. My time with him uh, more deliberately came later on when he was a, well, I take that back. The, the, the next time that I knew the same environment was when I was stationed in Germany in the mid eighties. Uh, and uh, my corps commander during this time, the, the army in Europe was a large army. There were two active corps. A corps are, are organizations that have two or more divisions assigned to them. And remember that I said, when I came in my division, it was almost 30,000 soldiers. So you have two or more uh, and all the things that go with it. And the corps are huge formations. Uh, uh, and, and my corps commander, I was in seventh corps, was a was a, was another was an African American, a black lieutenant general, and this was just a huge, huge uh, honor to be in an organization commanded by uh, an African American lieutenant general, uh, uh, Andy Chambers, the corps commander. And this corps was a corps that this again this is before the Iron Curtain came down, the Berlin Wall is still up, and so we're in the middle of a Cold War. And so the fact that on the front line of defense of our nation is this black corps commander. And then while I'm there in Seventh Corps with uh, Andy Chambers as my Corps Commander, uh, we get word that there's another Black Lieutenant General coming in to be the Commander of the other Corps, Fifth Corps, and that was Colin Powell, who came to Germany. So it, there was a brief period of time in our history where those two forward deployed Corps, Fifth Corps and Seventh Corps, were both commanded by African Americans. Little known fact about history, and I was privileged to be there in Germany during that time. Ironically, General Powell didn't stay very long uh, as the Corps Commander there, the Fifth Corps, because he was been there probably not less than, I mean, not more than a year, well, something less than maybe six or seven months, and he was asked to come back to the United States to be the uh, National Security Advisor, and that's what he did. So he was only the Corps Commander there for a short period of time, but that was our second time, or, or question, third time, that at least we were, I was in the same environment with him. Again, no, no special, special meetings. So the first time that there was actually some one-on-one -on -one time was when General Powell had gone through some of those three pieces and he was still on active duty and he was selected for his four star and he became the commander of the United States Forces Command. This is a command that was headquartered at that time in Atlanta, Georgia, that had responsibility for all US for forces uh, stationed in the United States. And at the time, uh, I was a lieutenant colonel commanding a battalion in Alaska. And although Alaska was not in the continental United States, it was a part of Forces Command. And General Powell came to Alaska uh, on a training visit and visited with uh, the division that was in Alaska at the time. And uh, my battalion did a live fire training exercise out in the Yukon for General Powell. And that's when we had our first time where we, some one-on-one -on -one discussions with him as he was talking about, it's your cold up here and how you're training in this cold weather and keeping equipment running and, and keeping troops uh, from being hurt. So those are all things that kind of led to leadership because you're, you're taking care of your people, you're taking care of uh, your equipment, you're getting the mission done. And he and I are talking about the things that are important to make that happen. 
paying attention to little things, uh, paying attention to, to where you're going, taking care of your people in ways that they know it, making sure that they're well-trained because we had a mission at that time. Again, this is in 1988, uh, 89, maybe it's still before the wall came down, still a cold war going on and our uh, Northern Defense Early Warning System, they call it the new line, Defense Early Warning, DEW, the whole communications network that goes across the Northern tier, across the Arctic, that helped us understand what was going on coming out of the Soviet Union. That's the mission that my battalion had up in Alaska. General Powell came up there to be a part of that. So we talked about the leadership things, uh, you know, the, the importance of giving you know, concise orders, the importance of, of letting your people carry things out, you know, trusting your people, building confidence in them. That was a part of it. The next iteration came for me when I'm, uh, I'm now promoted to full colonel uh, and I'm the uh, commander of the 2nd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division stationed at Fort Drum, New York. And the brigade is a is a, the next formation above a battalion. So, uh, so if I was a battalion commander in Alaska, I'm now a brigade commander at Fort Drum. And I've, I have three battalions in my brigade. And I had deployed with two of my battalions to Somalia in 1992 and 1993 uh, to, to help provide humanitarian support to the Somalians. General Powell is now no longer the commander of forces command, but he is now the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he comes to Somalia and visits with me uh, and, and, and my brigade stationed there in, in Somalia. And we have another chance to have these conversations about the mission, uh, how we adapt into this environment, how leaders are setting the tone, how we are the, the standards are, that are being set, how we're taking care of people, how we're training our people, uh, how we provide concise instructions and orders, but you're not overly supervising. You're trusting your men and your women to do the job. You give them all the resources they need to get the job done, and you trust them to carry it out and to execute it and make the uh, mission a success. So these are the things that General Powell and I talked about and we're doing in those iterations. Uh, next iteration for, for me, uh, I'm promoted to, to general officer. And by now, General Powell has taken off the uniform. He's no longer in, but, but he's still around. We, we still, and, and there would be times, especially in the Washington DC area where we would meet at various uh, events. And he and I would have meetings and we would talk more and more about my now being a general officer and then going to command uh, uh, a, a division uh, going to the NATO job that I always talked about. And then uh, importantly, when I was selected to be the inaugural commander of AFRICOM, he was the one who came to me and said, now he, he's already been the secretary of state. Uh, he's a uh, national security advisor to so achieve these things, but he comes and he tells me, he's been a chairman of the Joint Chief, says, you know, Kip, you're going to be our nation's first black combatant commander. And it hadn't dawned on me until then. And he, his wife, my wife and I is sitting at it and he and he says that to 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 me and and so we we talk about that we talk about uh you know his being the first in so many different things uh chair first black chairman the highest ranking member uh national security advisor and and what all that meant and so all those were things that we would I would sit and listen to him as he would impart to me uh with respect to moving forward so th th there was a single time when it, it was kind of a reverse. We, we, we were both retired and I had to come back and I had retired from, from AFRICOM. And uh, I was going to give a speech uh, to a group up in Connecticut. And uh, about five or six months later, he was asked to go, go there to the same place and, and, and give a speech. So he called me and asked me what I had talked about. He said, I don't want to talk about the thing that you talked about because I know if you talked about it, I don't want to repeat what you just said as well. So, so that's a part of how we share amongst each other. Uh, how leaders share, how we take the experience of, of, the, of others and then pass that along. Uh, for me, uh, what, one, one critical piece of it is you know, lifting as you climb. Uh, you, know, you, know, you don't get where you are by yourself. How you then as a leader assist others in elevating them uh, so that they can take advantage of your experiences and then build, build their own and take it to the next level. You know, General Colin Powell, you know, did that. 
And that's something that I, I to this day continue to try to do so that uh, uh, youngsters like you and others, uh, because where we were is nowhere near what it could be, but for having opportunities and but for folks like you taking advantage of things that are now in front of you, not being afraid to move out, take charge, go do it. Know that you're prepared for it. You know, those are lessons that not just Cole and Powell, but others of my mentors have given to me as well. And you know, those consistent messages. It's not as if any of these things are, are brand new and so unique. Mentors reinforce those things for you to let you know that you too can do these things. So don't be afraid, you know, you know, be trained, know your craft, you know, read, understand what it is, and don't be afraid to now take charge and move out. But it comes with you know, being the best at what you do. And that's the, the, the final message that I'll say about this. You, know, you can't know everything about all that your organization does. So you have to know enough and then trust your people that have the experience to do it. So you, you surround yourself with others that complement what you bring to the table. Not that you uh, know it all, because you don't. So you have to be savvy enough to know, hey, there's, some, there's a gap here, and I need to bring someone in to help that gap. And then you trust them to do that. But you compliment yourself. You give them the resources. And that's, that's, that's leadership. And General Powell, but, but so many others as well, have reinforced that to me. And that's what I attempt to do as well. Know your job, know your craft, read, study, so that when you make a statement, when you say something, you don't, you're do you not second guessing yourself, am I correct? You know you're correct. You know you're correct. Thank you for sharing your uh, friendship and uh, mentorship with uh, General Colin Powell. Now I'm going to ask you uh, about great power. And the competition is one of the top priorities in the U.S., natural security. For example, China is one of the top competitors and the US is currently competing against them in both hard and soft power. Can you please share your perspective about great power competition in the 21st century? Since you were the former AFRICOM commander, could you tell us how the US should engage in strategic competition in Africa? Yeah, I did a program a couple of uh years ago over at the University District of Columbia with respect to uh, our uh, role in Africa as an example, uh, as it compares to China. Uh, firstly, uh, this notion of competition, great power competition, I think if, if you aren't real careful when you use it, it, it will mean so many different things to so many people. You know, we don't compete with China the way China operates. We just don't do that. So, so when, when we talk about competition, it's not like you know, there are two fighters in the ring and they're, and they're both doing the same thing, trying to outdo the other, because we don't do what the Chinese do. The Chinese don't do what we do. Uh, we don't go uh, engage the way the Chinese. Uh, so it's, it's, it, it's for us, it's not all about competition. It's about us doing what we do, doing what we do in the United States, such that our actions causes our standing, our relationships and things that are important to us to be realized uh, in various parts of the global commons such that our national interests are being addressed in ways that make a positive difference to us. And so it's not a matter of competing with China the way China does its business. It's about US doing its business, doing what we do, so that it results in our being able to say, that our national interests are being realized in these various places. We need to do uh, in Africa and other places, things that we do from our investment policies to how we, how, how democracies operate professionally, how militaries operate professionally, our example, uh, our economic portfolio, how private businesses do work, how we help promote secure environments. So because we have, we have trained and caused other nations, militaries that want to partner with us to be more able to provide for their own security so that they, don't, they are not reliant on either outside mercenary forces so that their borders are less susceptible to those who will come in and take advantage of 
disgruntled populations who aren't being served well by effective and legitimate governments uh, so that the, the, the prospect of corruption gets reduced. I didn't say eliminated, but it gets reduced because it, 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 it happens, but so that it, it doesn't overshadow and cause the legitimate workings of government that are ought to about, about taking care of its people to be overshadowed and nullified. And how we promote those sorts of things is how we cause our standing to be what, what we want it to be, irrespective of what the Chinese are doing, because we can't control that. We can't compete head to head with that because we just don't do business that way. You know, our government doesn't go in with bags of money and cut deals under the table to get our way. That's not how we operate. And so, we, so, so when it comes to competition, that's not how we, we have to do the things that we do in ways that, that satisfy our national interests, but at the same time is in support of the interests of the partners that we're trying to uh, form these relationships with and cause them to have more stable environments so that there are markets for our goods and services available, so that our access to their systems, their resources, their populations, you know, at the continent of Africa, you know, by 2050, you know, over half the people who are under the age of 50 will be living in that continent. That's where the markets are. That's where the emerging populations are. That's where the youth of today are and, and of tomorrow will be. So when it comes to, to markets, access to resources, you know, we want to have the ability to be able to achieve our national interests in those environments as well. And so we do it by, by helping the partners be more effective in doing for them for themselves, not taking advantage of them like the Chinese do, not creating debt so that they, so the, the mortgaging, mortgaging their future generations for today, things of that nature. Now, there is this thing that the Chinese call the, 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 and it's not just the Chinese. I mean, Chinese are the big player for sure, but it's also, it's Russia, it's other countries uh, that, that, that go in and do things uh, because these governments, and I'll use to use Africa, they are trying to make a difference. And sometimes if, if some things aren't available to them, they'll take whatever that they, they have available to them. I mentioned at the beginning, this talk that I gave at the University of District of Columbia. And the question was, is the United States still a preferred partner in Africa? My answer was, yeah, short was, if we want to be, we are. If we want to be. So, and how do we want to be? Well, again, it's not because we go in and we do, we try to replicate and outdo the Chinese on taking in bags of money, making under the table deals, fueling corruption uh, in a society. It's by going in, creating effective partnerships, relationships, training, teaching, exchanging professionals back and forth, not just Africans coming here, but also you're not, we going there, learning from them. I think I talk about markets and population. How do we you know, advantage ourselves because of the, the, the populations? And one of the first things we have to do is try to ensure that the populations are healthy so that the migration things are, kind of, are reduced so that the Africans want for their children, same thing we want for ours, be able to go to school, get an education, live in, live in, live in health, be, be fed, walk to the store and not get robbed as they go on someplace, going to collect wood or water and girls being molested and raped because of, because of nefarious actors, a more secure environment. We, and I'll use the term, because compete by doing those things that help those nations be more self-sustaining, more self-reliant, more stable, less corrupt, more able to take care of their people in ways, be able to govern better because the, the institutions of government are more effective in addressing the needs of their people as opposed to the needs of, of a very select few who don't care about their people. So when we do those things, it doesn't, doesn't matter what the Chinese and others are doing, we are achieving our objectives in ways that no one else can do. And that's how we go to these various places and make a difference. And, and no one can do that as well as we can in the United States. We didn't colonize Africa. Yeah, we, 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 weren't, we weren't on the, the, the right side a time or two to be, to be sure. But we go there with, we don't have that baggage, if you will, of, of trying to be a, a former colony and trying to impose our will 
on a people. We go there, understand from their perspective what's important to them, and do our best to help them achieve goodness for their people, and at the same time, doing things that are in, that are consistent with our own national security interests as well. And when we do that, uh, what others do, yeah, they'll be there doing with you, but th that our partner countries will see that, hey, that model is not working for us because in the, in the end, it's disadvantaging us. What the U.S. brings to the table will, in a sustained long term is more in our, in our, to our interests. And so from our economic policies, to our diplomatic and governance and engagement activities, to the things that we do to help them provide for their own security in legitimate ways so that their people know that their security forces are truly protecting them and not just protecting some small element of the society, uh, that the leaders, if you will, that's when we are doing what we need to do to make a difference. And when we do that, we are achieving our interests. Doesn't matter what others who come into the area did, are doing. Thank you, sir. On behalf of DINSN, uh, I want, we want to humbly thank you for your time today. Also, thank you for allowing us to get to know you more intimate and an intimate more look in your life and contributions and standing on your shoulders to elevate voices as future leaders. Thank you so much, sir, for, the, for this interview. It was an honor. Roberto, I mean, uh, Gilberto, thank you, sir. Uh, it was a pleasure being a part of this. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. I wish you all the best as you move forward and also all in your network, the diversity and national security network. Uh, we, we need you. Our nation needs you. The global, the global commons need you because we need concerned professionals who come in and truly want to understand the environment in which we work and then bring their best ideas to that environment to help create decisions that are more encompassing and addressing the needs of the, of the day. And not just from one perspective, but from multiple perspectives. You know, one quick thing I, I, I look at, you know, when you have a decision to be, to be made, the more input you have, the more diversity of thought that you have. And, it, and that's not to say that everything that someone says has to be done, but at least when it's taken into account, it tends to flavor the decision in a way that will lead to a more positive, long lasting and sustained outcome. And when we have diversity in our national security apparatus from security to diplomacy, to the intelligence fields, when we, when, when we have diversity in all those areas, the decisions that emanate will be better decisions for our nation and in reaching our national interests. So we need you, we need your colleagues, stay with it, stay motivated, and uh, look forward to all that you continue to do in the interests of yourselves, your communities, our nation, and indeed the global commons. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.